everyone, this is Amanda Moore from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, and you're listening to the ASF Podcast, the show that explains everything you want to know about Angelman Syndrome. We're so excited you're here, and we hope you enjoy the show. we're sharing a session from the 2024 ASF Family Conference. We hope you find this information helpful and enjoy the listen. Hello, hello. Having fun? All right. My name is Courtney Swafford, and I am so excited to introduce these two incredible folks over here today. Um, My son, Aaron, is seven, and he has the UPD subtype of Angelman. Um, My older son, Drew, is also here. He's nine, so he's currently having fun um, playing laser tag. Uh, But I believe Amanda and Chloe asked for me to introduce Dr. Kiri and uh, Dr. Ochoa Lubinoff because we uh, have been uh, talking with both of them for a while about both behaviors and anxiety. Um, Aaron was diagnosed when he was 18 months old. And soon after that, we were meeting with an incredible child psychologist in Atlanta. Her name is Dr. Dr. Kathy Platzman. And I'll never forget that she said, okay, we just need to take Aaron down from a 10 to an eight because he is so incredible and he has so much to say, but truth be told, he's going to be labeled the bad kid. And that stuck with my husband and me because we know how incredible he is. But the behaviors don't always come across in the most positive way. And we're constantly told behaviors are a form of communication, but it's also really hard both on Aaron, on our angels, and on parents, caregivers, and siblings. We play next door um, with our next door neighbors all the time. And for some reason, Aaron just loves to go up to the younger ones and just swat him on the head. And it's a form of getting their attention. It's a form of communication, but it's also something that is really, really hard to navigate. So like I said, I am just so excited that we have Dr. Kiri and Dr. Ochoa Lubinoff here today to talk to us about managing behaviors and anxiety anxiety with our Angelman kids and adults. So give it up. Big round of applause. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That was so kind. Um, I see some friendly faces in the audience, which is great. Um, Makes me feel at ease. And for those of you who haven't met, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Chris Geary. I'm a uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work at the Mass General Hospital uh, Angelman Syndrome Clinic as the behavioral director. Uh, It is a uh, real privilege to be here today. Thank you for your interest. And a real privilege to present with Dr. Ochoa Lubinoff, um, the director of behavioral pediatrics at Mount Sinai a wonderful colleague and friend. Um, I want to also call out some wonderful contributions from Dr. Anjali Sadwani, uh, Jane Summers, and Ann Wheeler, who contributed some of the ideas and even slides for this presentation. Very grateful. Uh, So let's get started. All right, it's working. (laughs) Um, So we're going to take some time today talking about common behavioral challenges. What do we know from research about the sort of prevalence and what are the types of behavioral concerns that we see in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. And then we're going to talk a little bit about taking what I will call a chain analysis. I'll explain what's meant by that or a functional behavioral assessment to kind of understand when we see challenging behaviors, how do we understand what drives them, which I think about as being the the core of developing a treatment plan. We're going to also talk about some of these sort of somewhat hidden behavioral concerns Um, hidden medical concerns that can sometimes look like behavioral issues that we don't want to miss. These are somewhat hidden medical issues that can sometimes explain behavioral changes, and we want to have our antenna up for catching those. And then we're going to talk about some particular cases that Dr. Ochoa Lubinoff and I have seen some sort of combination of really common chief complaints and what's been helpful for them. What have some of the behavioral ideas, structural ideas, medication ideas that helped them. We're going to go up through a couple of cases, and then we'll leave some time for questions. So let's jump in. Behavioral concerns are common in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. They emerge oftentimes. They can be present at young ages, become more of a concern uh, as life goes on. 
Sometimes the behavioral concerns that are an issue in childhood become even more of an issue now when we get to adulthood. So I think about behavioral concerns as being an issue that cuts across, but particularly important in adulthood. And behavioral concerns can get in the way of being able to take advantage of therapies, speech therapy, behavioral, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy. It can get in the way of being able to be a part of inclusion programs at school. It can make it hard to be eligible for the best uh, or the most community-oriented day programs for adults and even residential programs. And it can get in the way of being involved in your community in a way that we want, being able to go out to a restaurant, go to your sibling's hockey game, and it's incredibly gratifying to work with families as they make progress in these areas, because as they make progress in these areas, their life opens up to being a bigger part of their community, which is the type of community I would want to live in. So um, it's really important work. We're going to talk about some research that talks about the prevalence of these issues. And we have the Natural History Study and the Ladders Learning Network to thank for these findings. So if you have been involved in the Natural History Study or the Ladders Learning Network, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's one of the ways we know what are the medical issues and behavioral issues that people struggle with, especially moving into adulthood. We want to know more. It's helpful to researchers. It's helpful to families. If you've been involved, thank you. And if you haven't, consider going to one of the tables today for the Ladders Learning Network or the um, Natural History Study to see if there's a way for you to be involved for us to learn more. Uh, so let's jump into some findings. This is a study, uh, the results of a study that was published in 2019 that is drawn from the natural history study, which is, again, the largest study that we have over the longest period of time to answer what are the health problems that kids, teens, and importantly, adults face with Angelman. And this um, included hundreds of individuals with Angelman syndrome. And you can see in this figure here um, uh, a number of behaviors that they asked about. And then percentage of people that had those behaviors. So look how close some of these bars are to 100%. Okay, so it highlights how significant the issue of behavioral concerns are. And you can see with each one of the behaviors of, of concern here, we've got a couple of bars. The top bar is individuals with a deletion, maternal deletion form of mechanism of inheritance. Then we have a bar for uniparental disomy and printing center defects. And then we have down... The, the third of the bars is uh, UBE3A mutations. Mouthing behavior is the most common, but I'm going to draw out a couple of um, items here. Uh, well, the second one down, easy excitability, a little bit farther down from there, short attention span and hyperactivity. I kind of put these all in a similar kind of category, hyperactivity, challenges with attention. These were, again, some of the most common behavioral concerns, and they kind of mostly cut across all the different mechanisms of inheritance of Angelman and tend to be the most common concerns. And that fits with my experience. This is oftentimes the chief complaint of families when I'm seeing them. A little farther down, we get to aggressive behaviors, biting, hair pulling, pinching, temper tantrums. And now we start to see some pattern emerging where um, they're a little bit more common in uniparental diasomy, a little bit more common in printing center defects in UBE3A mutations, but also not zero in individuals with maternal deletion mechanisms of inheritance. But we're starting to see a little bit more frequent in, in these, some of these other um, populations within Angelman. And then we get down to anxiety, which is lower on the list, but also some of these bars are pretty close to 50%. So it looks like behavioral concerns, even with anxiety, really are, are a frequent frequent area of concern. We're going to call out and get into greater detail some of the issues around hyperactivity, attention span, anxiety, and aggressive behaviors. But before we present some particular cases, um, I want to talk with you about how I kind of approach a concern about a, a behavioral concern when I'm seeing a family. Let's say I'm seeing an adult in clinic the first step I take is I start to learn more about those behaviors by looking at the antecedents, the behavior itself, and the consequence, doing what I will call a chain analysis of the most common scenarios where you see that behavior. And I do that to try and kind of, as much as I can, put myself in the mind uh, uh, of the, the person with Angelman in terms of trying to understand what they might be thinking or feeling when that behavior takes place. And I think that this is a really important thing for us to be doing. We want schools to be doing this. We want day programs to be doing this. Don't just tell me about the behavior. Tell me about what happened before. Tell me about what happened afterwards so we can really understand it and put ourselves in the mind of, of our loved one with Angelman. Um, this is also called a functional behavioral 
assessment, an FBA, if you're steeped in the sort of terminology of applied behavioral analysis, ABA, and requesting a functional behavioral assessment of the school, an FBA, if a certain behavior is a major concern is one thing parents can do to try and do just what I'm talking about. And this is a great example that um, Ann Wheeler contributed for this presentation. So the example here is the teacher asks the student to sit in a circle. The student responds with pulling the hair of their peer. And then the aide takes the student who pulled the hair out of the room. And then a pattern starts to emerge where it happens multiple times. And it wouldn't take a whole lot of investigation to realize that Peter probably doesn't want to sit in the circle or maybe sitting for a long time in general, something Peter doesn't want. And so this sort of process of looking at the antecedent, looking at the, the consequence, environmental consequence, helps us understand a little bit more what might be going on for Peter in terms of escaping a non-preferred demand. There was a research study, um, part of the natural history study, where they took disruptive behaviors and they did this process, looking at the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence, trying to understand what are the common patterns in terms of driving disruptive behavior. Communication was number one, and this we can be sympathetic to this, how frustrating it must be to have your needs not met, to not be able to communicate in a way that the rest of the world understands. It's got to be extraordinarily frustrating. So it makes sense. Communication would be would be number one here. But also really important here is all the way over on the on the on, on your left, attention seeking. That's pretty close to fifty percent in terms of how common um, cause for disruptive behavior. Um, we also have craving sensory input. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means and then and then avoidance, getting out of a non-preferred demand, like the example we gave with Peter. So let's um, drill down into these different categories and talk about some patterns that you can see in Angelman that you all are probably well familiar with. And we'll talk a little bit about some behavioral ideas off the bat. Now, I'll say as a caveat, I'm usually in these talks... Um, talking to a wide range of families with different experiences. Some of you will be hearing about these behavioral ideas for the first time, and some of you will be like, yeah, we tried that, we tried that. So take what fits for you and leave the rest aside. We'll talk about other behavioral ideas, uh, other ideas outside of behavioral approaches or structural changes. Just listen for the piece that resonates with you. And also understand that sometimes behavioral ideas don't work until you make other changes, like structural changes or medication changes, and then you can revisit some of these ideas that didn't work before. But if we talk about ideas that didn't help for you, don't worry, you're in good company. Let's talk first about the function of attention seeking. So it's important to first understand that a lot of, um, a lot of specialists in neurodevelopmental conditions think about um, Angelman syndrome as having on average, for the majority, really strong social needs. And it being somewhat a, um, a condition of strong social interest, hyper sociability. So if you combine a really strong desire for emotional connectedness and eye contact and affection and physical closeness, and you combine that with somebody who struggles with communication, you see the stage is set for challenging behaviors to get attention. And it's a really common feature for uh for, for kids, teens, and adults that I work with. And so part of this is first understanding and being sympathetic to having a strong social drive, but not being able to always, always meet it and how often disruptive behaviors step in to serve that purpose for kids, teens, and adults with Angelman. And how hard it is to address these. You know, we, uh, I think we all have an instinct, teachers, caregivers, parents, to explain why a unsafe behavior is is not safe and why we don't do this and why it's not in our family values or why we don't want to do this. Sometimes any attention is good attention, even bad attention. So a lot of families will tell me that even though I know my loved one is feels bad about hitting me and they say they're sorry, like explaining it is really just not getting us where we want to get to. So um, it's almost like any attention can be good attention, even bad attention. And also, it's oftentimes really hard to ignore these attention-seeking behaviors because kids, teens, and adults with Angelman are really good at figuring out where's the edge where you can't ignore me, and they will up the ante for sure if they get the sense that they're being ignored. And so ignoring, in my experience, really, in my experience, is, is of oftentimes of limited benefit. Um, so what tend to be more helpful approaches? Um, if we think about a lot of the challenging disruptive behaviors and we identify this one as, ooh, this looks like it's attention-seeking, and I look for that sort of 
delight and excitement when people respond to the disruptive behavior as kind of a clue, then we can think about that disruptive behavior as kind of being like a social bid. And with social bids, we want to, as much as possible, redirect to the more appropriate way for the social bid, which might be the usage of the AAC, the hitting the button that says, play with me, or, you know, my name is Ben, nice to meet you, or some, some other alternative social bid using that AAC device. Or if AAC really hasn't taken off for that individual, it might be a, a card with an introduction or a button that's pressed that says hi, or I really like this, a tap on the shoulder, sort of in a neutral way, redirecting to the other way to make a social bid and make a connection and having all the individuals in the your loved one with Angelman syndrome's life be consistently sort of redirecting back to that more appropriate social bid. And then if it starts to sick and individuals are doing it spontaneously, it's like the biggest party ever and the most reward and you did great and I'm so proud of you for the tap on the shoulder and trying to as much as possible see if that other way to make a social bid starts to be used spontaneously. This is a really great um, program that could be part of a behavioral plan that the school, a school or a day program for adults might use. Like for instance, a lot of times you may hear from the day program, we're seeing hitting behavior, we're seeing hair pulling behavior. Now we're requesting a, a good response would be to request, can we get a behavioral clinician involved to put a plan like this in place where everybody is consistently redirecting their loved one with Angelman syndrome to use this other more appropriate social bid? So this is an example of what might be a behavioral approach. Some schools might even design a uh, practice scenario where someone will go up to a peer and practice this social bid behavior with a big reward at the end. Sensory seeking behaviors. Another important thing to think about is for a lot of kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome, they may have different sensory needs. We saw number one on that like graph was mouthing behaviors, right? And so this, this is a sort of hint to us that many kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome have unique sensory needs, particularly around oral motor um, feedback, um, repetitive sort of picking behaviors of the hands or chewing behaviors of the fingers. And um, we want to be aware that those sensory needs are there and as much as possible engage clinicians like occupational therapists or, or uh, creative um, special needs teachers to be looking, are there other um, sensory input that we can offer and be giving to our loved ones with Angelman syndrome to get that same sensory need met, but to do it in a way that's safe and not damaging the teeth or damaging the fingers. Um, also, it's aware that many people with Angelman syndrome might have aversions to certain sensory experiences. So you might notice disruptive behaviors when going into the crowd or when going into the more noisy or echoey environment, and then looking for that as a pattern sometimes around a sensory experience that leads to someone being upset or anxious. Um, and also, this is an area where sometimes we can see sensory seeking behaviors spike when people are having reflux, for instance, or other medical issues or pain. So when I see... Um, disruptive behaviors that seem to come on apropos of nothing without any external stimuli in the environment, I think along these lines. And then lastly, I'll just talk about escaping from demands before I pass along to, um, to Dr. Ochoa Lobanoff here. This is another really common function that disruptive behavior can serve. Um, frustrated with a non-preferred demand, can we sit on the toilet for one more minute to do the toileting plan? Um, and then seeing the hit in that regard. Um, and this can be exacerbated by challenges with waiting, frustration tolerance, which is really common challenge for, for, for a lot of kids, teens, and adults with Angelman. I think about the first this, then that programs. Can we have reward systems that are like right after the particular non-preferred demand? Can we use things like timers to say, can we stick with this for 30 more seconds, then 45 more seconds, then maybe one more minute? trying to use that timer to extend a little bit farther the therapy, extend a little bit longer the non-preferred demand. Um, and then for a lot of families, they'll tell me that using humor, using lightness in terms of the tone of voice, the tone of voice is so important in terms of putting a limit set in place that clinicians or, 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 or teachers or, or um, day program staff that use a more firm my way or the highway kind of tone in terms of how they interact, that that's much more likely to make things worse rather than someone who uses humor, lightness, and, and relies on the relationship to put in non-preferred demands. Um, while food is oftentimes a really common reward and that works, um, there are 
a lot of ways you can use the strong social interest that people with Angelman have as a potential reward. So some other really incentivizing rewards for a lot of kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome might be a picture book of the family doing things together, a collection of videos of the family doing things together. I have a lot of families I work with that have like an old school picture book with the glossy photos, like hidden in the bathroom somewhere. And if we could do like one more minute on the bathroom, we're going to pull out the photos and as a reward, look through them together. Um, water play, bubbles, some preferred sensory toys that could be a real big hit for some individuals, and social rewards. I've seen a lot of creative teachers have as a reward for sticking with the therapy a little bit longer, going to give a high five to the front desk staff at the school, for instance, or a very brief time-limited FaceTime call. Um, these kind of using social as a reward and incentive can oftentimes be really powerful. Hey guys, it's Amanda here. As you know, we're here for you, our community. If you have questions about any topics we can discuss in our podcast, or if you have ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. All you need to do is email me at dearamanda at angelman.org. Thank you so much for listening and your continued support of the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. Okay, I'm going to pass things along here to... Uh, Dr. Ochoa Lobanoff, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Kerry, for an excellent presentation. Um, so um, when, when we have um, uh, a patient, when you have a child with uh, Angel Man that has uh, behavioral difficulties, the first thing we want to think is, is there something medical that could be causing those behavioral difficulties before jumping into the behavioral management? So insufficient sleep, uh, can cause irritability. We all know for uh, for us, when we don't sleep well, the next day we might be irritable, grumpy, and more prone to have uh, dysregulation. So it's, it's important to think about sleep difficulties and address them. Constipation. Constipation is very prevalent in, in uh, individuals that live with Angelman syndrome, and it's important to think about that and address those concerns when there are behavioral difficulties. Gastroesophageal reflux can be present. It's more prevalent in younger children, but older um, individuals with Angelman syndrome can also present reflux. And it's important to think if there's any relation in the behavioral challenges with the uh, meals, after meals. Uh, once a um, young woman with um, uh, Angelman syndrome have uh, periods, menstrual periods, and then they start having these behavioral difficulties arising more before or right after the menstrual periods. We need to think about that as a cause, and we need to address that, this menorrhea. Uh, dental problems sometimes have go under the radar. It, it's really hard to get um, angels evaluated by dentists, but we, we need to make an effort to find the right dentist that can evaluate mm -hmm. um, angelman uh, individuals uh, and, and, you know, prevent these dental problems. But when there are behavioral difficulties, we should also think about that. Uh, scoliosis is important too. Uh, also, uh, sometimes when there are seizures, after the seizures, there can be periods of irritability. And changes in medication can also lead to behavioral difficulties. Some anticonvulsants can, can lead to irritability, but there are other medications that seem to be very benign, but sometimes uh, have these paradoxical effects on behavior. So, um, you know, we always want to try uh, behavioral interventions. We want to accommodate um, Angelman syndrome uh, individuals uh, with behavioral interventions, uh, but sometimes behaviors are very challenging. Sometimes we do everything and nothing seems to uh, make things better. And sometimes there are these um, disruptive, aggressive behaviors in the household, at school, in the daycare, for uh, for adults in the in the day program. Sometimes behaviors can be very challenging, and in those situations, when safety is an issue and 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 the behavioral challenges are unbearable for the family for the staff, what can we do? And we need to think about the the last resource is pharmacotherapy. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, we're going to have um, we're going to talk a little bit about anxiety. Anxiety is an emotional disorder, and in, in theory, anxiety you want uh, individuals that suffer from anxiety to describe you the anxiety 
to to give this formal diagnosis, but our Angelman patients don't don't communicate effectively about their internal emotions. So, but we do know that they have anxiety. They often have anxiety. Um, so how does anxiety look like in Angelman syndrome? When we think about anxiety, we think about nervousness, about fear, about phobias. But uh, many times in, Ange- in individuals with Angelman syndrome, it presents a little different. It can present like irritability, agitation. There can be increased restlessness and distractibility. There can be an increase in uh, repetitive ritualistic behaviors. There can be a lot of crying and screaming or um, aggressive behaviors. And sometimes there can be somatic complaints, sometimes gagging or vomiting or increased sweating. So it's important to think about uh, when there are changes in behavior, to think about anxiety as a common cause. So what are the possible sources of stress or anxiety in uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome? Separation. Separation anxiety is a very frequent cause for anxiety, separating from their parents or from a preferred caregiver. Um, New situations, being in a new place, uh, being uh, with a new uh, individual, that can be a very common uh, situation too. Uh, When they are in a situation where the expectations are beyond their abilities, like they're expected to sit or to pay attention in a classroom where which is not the right placement. And sometimes when there are too many things going on at once or when there is sensory overstimulation, like too many sounds, too many smells. Uh, so we, we always need to think, you know, when we see these disruptive behaviors, what does that mean? What is our um, child with Angelman syndrome trying to tell us when he's, having, he's acting up, he's having these disruptive behaviors? They may be saying, I'm nervous about leaving my parent or preferred caregiver. I get scared when I don't know what to expect. I get stressed when things are very difficult for me to do. Um, I don't like how I feel inside myself. Um, I get stressed because the, the environment is too crowded or noisy. And um, I'm, this situation makes me think about uh, pain, other situations where I have uh, pain or discomfort. So we have some evidence, Dr. Kerry, uh, he, he published an article in 2022 and Dr. Wheeler, an article in 2019, where they studied anxiety in uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome. And something that they found is, is very frequent, is very prevalent anxiety in Angelman syndrome. And uh, the other thing is that the common trigger for anxiety is separation. Separation anxiety is the most common trigger. Uh, uh, separation is the common trigger for anxiety. And how does it present? The most frequent presentation for anxiety in individuals with Angelman syndrome is aggression. It's aggression sometimes presents also with uh, difficulties with sleep or um, hyperactivity. Um, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about a case. So there's Alice. She's a 20-year-old woman with a deletion. And uh, she has a lot of difficulty separating from her mom. Her mom needs to sneak out when she has to go to work and distract so she stays with the, with the caregiver. Uh, but when we see her with the, with the mom, she's calm um, and, and she's fine when mom is around. But when mom leaves, there's a lot of laughter, hitting, biting, throwing... Um, to get the mother's attention. So how do we approach this situation? So first we wanna make sure that there's no medical contributor. So we get a medical history and make sure that the medical contributors I I mentioned at the beginning are not present. And uh, we we also try to work with occupational therapy. Occupational therapy can do a good job taking advantage of the sensory differences many patients with Angelman syndrome have. And try to, you know, sometimes you can do a massage, you can do a, a noise canceling headphone. So there are many options that you can use to address behaviors with occupational therapy. Uh, Dr. Keir already mentioned how important is communication. And the, the insufficient communication can lead to a lot of anxiety and a lot of behavioral difficulties. So we always emphasize the importance to doing, uh, trying to do alternative communication as possible, as much as possible. And then psychological interventions. Uh, Trying to do a consistent routine is always going to be helpful. Um, 
collecting uh, videos, pictures can help incentivize kids for these transitions that are difficult. Also, sometimes we can try to expose them gradually to these transitions. And, and sometimes we can use social stories like pictures with social stories that can help understand what's coming. Uh, and, and finally, something that can be helpful is taking advantage of this fear of missing out that uh, individuals with angioma have and trying to um, incentivize them using things that they like, like fun things to, to help move on with the transition. So in terms of medications for anxiety, and, you know, we usually in, in, in general patients, we use SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors to deal with anxiety as a first line of medication. Like I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, Soloft, uh, Prozac, Lexapro are, are really effective medications in general. But individuals with angina syndrome are very sensitive to these medications and oftentimes present side effects to them. So we usually don't go to these medications as a first line. So we use Buspiron. There are studies that show that Buspiron does a good job in terms of addressing anxiety in patients with angina syndrome. It doesn't work for everyone, but when things are really hard, it's worth to take, give a try to these medications. There's another medication in this uh, group, the mirtazapine, that is sometimes used. We also use, uh, you know, there are some situations where like there's a flight and a family is flying, but uh, a child with angina syndrome or an adult with angina syndrome gets really anxious to get in an airport in a flight. And in those situations, we can use benzodiazepines, which are short acting anxiety medications that can be very helpful for these uh, episodes of high stress and can help the family move forward. Uh, propanolol is another medication, it's an antihypertensive medication that can also help with acute anxiety. And, and we all, we have other additional treatments uh, like guanfacin, clonidine, uh, an antihistaminic like hydroxazine that has been used anecdotally to treat anxiety and sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. I also, we also wanted to comment on CBD oil. There has been a lot of talk of CBD oil. There's a CBD oil from uh, for angina syndrome patients. And um, I, we haven't found it as helpful, but you know, it can be in consultation with your uh, child's doctors, it can be worth to give a try. Something, I, I think the big message for addressing uh, anxiety and other behavioral difficulties in angina syndrome is, you know, angina patients are, um, they have difficulties tolerating medications, but sometimes situations are extreme. So it's worth to work with a, a physician that has experience working uh, with these situations and trying different things, but it's gonna be a trial and error kind of situation. But if you work with your uh, physician, you, you can find um, a solution. There, there's hope and for, for many situations. So I wanted to talk a, a little bit about disruptive behaviors, emotional dysregulation. And it's not uncommon for uh, individuals with angina syndrome to have explosive behaviors, like throwing objects. Those are, are common situations. And, and the frequency of these uh, emotional difficulties can, can vary depending on the uh, mechanism for angina syndrome. Something that is important to notice is uh, these emotional regulation difficulties tend to increase over time. Uh, as, as, you know, as Angeman uh, individuals get older, it can get worse sometimes. Uh, and then we have a case of an adult patient, a 32 year old man with uh, Angeman via uniparental disomy. He has a, he, ten, he, he tends to bite, shout, and flop to the ground when he's exposed to limit setting, when he's redirected, when he's asked to leave the pool. Community outings are increasingly unpredictable and dangerous. And, and there, there are situations of property damage and, and heating when there are visitors coming to the house or uh, when working with a non-preferred caregiver. So may, he may bite out of the blue when he's hugged. So how do we approach this situation? So we follow the same protocol, evaluating for medical contributors, occupational therapy, communication, uh, trying to use alternative communication strategies to teach him to request breaks uh, and to use appropriate uh, social beats for attention. And uh, we can try to help identify the triggers 
and uh, try to do some environmental ch- uh, changes instead of hugging, maybe doing a face bump. Um, and in terms of, you know, this is a little bit different than anxiety because there's this regulation and there's aggression. But oftentimes the, the bottom line for these behaviors are anxiety. So we, we use the same medications that we use for anxiety as first line of intervention. But in the more severe cases, we have bigger guns, like bigger medications that we can use. Uh, some of these medications are the atypical antipsychotics, which is a big name for uh, Risperidone, Abilify, Quetiapine. And, and those medications can be very effective in regulating emotions and aggressive behaviors. The problem is these medications also have a lot of side effects. So they, there's increased appetite, there's weight gain, there can be some uh, unusual movements that can come out of these medications. So it's important to be careful about using them and we usually reserve them as a last resource, but sometimes you have to go for them because the situation is unbearable. Uh, but you, you want to keep track with your doctor of the side effects. Uh, sometimes even these medications are not as helpful, and there are some uh, anti-epileptic medications that can be used to regulate emotions. Uh, they, they are a little bit hit or miss, but uh, sometimes they can be eff- effective with a, a lower um, side effect cost. And, and finally, we're going to talk a little bit about hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention, which, you know, is very frequent in individuals with Angelman syndrome. We tend to see that a little more in young children with deletion, a lot of hyperactivity, impulsivity. And I wanted to talk about a patient, Nicholas. He's a, he was a seven-year-old boy. He was constantly moving, unable to sit still in class, and he was unable to focus his attention to do work in class. At home, he was nonstop. He would not sit still for meals. And safety was a concern when going to community outings. Like parents were very nervous about taking him out because he could just run away uh, and be unaware of danger. So what, what we did with this, we did first all the non-pharmacological interventions, but they didn't seem to make a difference. So we tried guanfacine. Guanfacin is an alpha-2 agonist, a, a very benign medication in terms of long-term side effects. And it does a good job taking down the hyperactivity and the impulsivity. The big side effect is tiredness. It can make it tired, and it can also sometimes cause more irritability. But we were able to start with a quarter tablet with this kiddo, and we went up to half tablet, and it, make a big, it made a big difference for him. It's not perfect. His behavior is not perfect, but it it was able to take the edge without significant side effects. So he was able to sit a little longer in class, at least do participate in more activities, which was very meaningful for the family. Um, So um, Wanfacin, Clonidine are two of these medications that can be very helpful with uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity. They also have a touch of effect on anxiety and emotional regulation. Um, there are other medications that can be used um, for Angelman syndrome, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Uh, but I, I think the, the, pref- the preferred medications are guanfacine or clonidine. Something that needs to be mentioned is, um, you know, these behaviors sound like ADHD. And, and sometimes we think about using a stimulant medications like Ritalin, Adderall for uh, uh, people living with Angelman syndrome, but the problem is the stimulants have a lot of side effects in the majority of individuals with Angelman syndrome. So it's not like it cannot be tried, but we usually don't go directly there. We use it as a more like a, a last resource if parents are motivated, but there's a high chance for having irritability, emotionality with stimulants. Um, so I wanted to... I was looking for a slide that is not there, but, um, you know, the latter uh, is doing a, an, an effort to to um, get more information about how to ask questions about anxiety, about behavioral difficulties in the database. And uh, you are going to be receiving a survey from Ladder, and it would be great if you could participate in that survey. And I also wanted to mention that I recently moved from Chicago to L.A. We have a new clinic in L.A., and we have a multidisciplinary team and we're trying to do research over there. Thank you.
Um, I think we might have time for five minutes of questions, maybe along those lines, if we're not cutting into another presentation. So microphone is right over here if anyone wants to come up. And also we're both friendly. So if you see us around the conference floor, stop us, come up to us, ask us your personal questions. That's the reason we're here. And uh, we, we'd love to get questions like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you both for being here. I have a question about um, the anxiety leading to like this gagging and, and refluxy kind of sound. It's new for us. It started in June of this year. And at first I ruled out everything medical. I'm talking like a CAT scan. He was complaining of pain and, and we ruled all that out, but it's been happening more and more. So I didn't know if that, you know, on the lines of anxiety, if that could be the cause. Could you describe the behavior one minute? Cause I kind of, the mic didn't. Oh, sorry. Out. Yeah. So he does this like gagging, like yeah. actually gets a yeah. bucket, holds the bucket. We'll go get a bowl out of the cabinet. You know, if the bucket's not available, we tried to switch it up and hide the bucket. He seemed to prefer to see if it was, you know, like a, I don't know, a habit. And he would just go and get another bowl out of the cabinet mm -hmm. and just gagging a lot and like making this retching sound, but not actually vomiting at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's that's a really great question. I'm glad you brought it up because I have absolutely seen repetitive retching or even getting into like a cycle of vomiting in situations where anxiety is taking place. Now, we have to be careful that we're not missing reflux because that's really common in Angelman. Um, and that can absolutely be the explanation. I also think about um, kids, teens, and adults with Angelman having just a more sensitive gag reflex around really strong sense. So, I have a lot of families I work with where the child walks into the cafeteria at the school and then there's a wretch like all the you know like intense smells but sometimes it's totally unrelated to those issues and it's specifically when mom is leaving the room so you might look to see around what are the antecedents and could anxiety be taking place if anxiety is taking place the way i think about it is almost being like the fight or flight response like your body surging with adrenaline and that gives you butterflies in the stomach and um sweating and pacing and things like that. So this could very well be an anxiety related reaction. And we've had a lot of success with um, actually the medication Boosperone and other medications that reduce a little bit of the intensity of the fight or flight response helping with that. So for the repetitive retching, it's good to look out for anxiety as being a potential cause. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. My son is 31. Um, and recently, um, he had gone to see his neurologist and I was talking about his, um, anxiety or his behaviors that he's picking at his hands a lot and raw and he won't leave on a bandage. So he recommended clonopin, but he's already on clonopin for his seizures. So giving him more clonopin, he was more tired. So we stopped that. Then we went to his regular doctor and she said, well, he's harming himself. So they gave him lorazepam and they told me to give him lorazepam when he did that. My thing is I don't like to medicate him so much. Is there a different medication? And I know that there's a reason why, I mean, it, it happens on the van going home and, and, and when he's not able to tell us something and I know it's communication, but what else am I supposed to do for that? Um, and and it is an anxiety. And I I very rarely give him the lorazepam. But he also has the thing where he um, laughs so hard that and and he has the laryngospasms. And, you know, he laughs and he breathes so hard. He also has the gagging when he goes into the, like the women's bathroom. That's, you know, a behavior too. So um, would your recommendation be like, do I go to the Mayo Clinic and, and go to the, one of the Angelman things and, and clinics and get answers, more answers for Nathan? Thank you for the question. Um, I, it sounds like uh, your child has a lot of anxiety in, in different situations. Um, sounds like the, the bus, um, wonder if you know working with a, a behavioral therapist could be ways to alleviate the anxiety trying to understand what is it that is triggering that anxiety if there could be ways to alleviate by you know maybe doing a social story doing an incentive that distracts him during the trip 
uh, that could be controlled. Um, but, the, you know, the picking behavior is concerning. Uh, but sounds like it's not just that, but it's, there are other scenarios where there's high uh, level of anxiety. So when, when anxiety is that significant is, and is pervasive in different situations, it, it, it may be appropriate to consider doing a psychopharmacology intervention. And the, the medication that we use as first line, uh, like I mentioned before, like the typical uh, medications for anxiety can cause side effects in many uh, individuals that live with Angelman syndrome. So buspirone seems to could be a good starting point uh, for that. And uh, yeah, ideally you want to work uh, with a physician that has experience working with those medications. And oftentimes the people that work with Angelman syndrome patients have experience. So, so would you, rec well, so would you recommend me asking you later what what doctors in like around the Milwaukee area Milwaukee Wisconsin area that I could go and see for that yeah we could we could we could talk about that okay. and um yeah, and I, I, anecdotally also, if, if it would be just the picking behavior, I have experience with uh, other patients uh, where the problem is just picking behavior, which is not your child's case, uh, because there's more anxiety in different situations. But uh, the n cysteine, the NAC, can be helpful with specific picking behaviors. But in your child's case, it seems to be more like a pervasive anxiety. Okay, yeah, thank in, you. In situations like like that, where picking can also become a habit and a sensory driven thing. And I look for it happening in those situations where there's unstructured time, where there's like, no one's asking anything um, that's a significant demand of the individual. It's like, maybe they'll do it where they're watching a television show or something like that. They're in their comfort zone. It's more of a habit, a sensory related thing. In those situations, I'm also thinking about, can you give the person something else to keep their hands busy? Play-Doh, fidgets, something like that. Can we provide some structure or stimulation during that time so they're otherwise busy and it's less open-ended? And um, in some cases, it's severe as needing to temporarily wear a glove of some kind, because yeah, that might be a no go. I uh, it's a limited number of people that can tolerate it. But sometimes with the ha with these, it's kind of like a habit. Like the more you do it, the more you do it. So if there's something that blocks it, you can get out of the habit if you're willing to um, tolerate the glove for certain times of the day. You may not need to do it long term. Um, and sometimes treatments for hyperactivity can help when this is the cause as well, like fidgeting, restlessness. So the guanfacine idea that that um, Cesar was talking about can also sometimes be helpful. But uh, hopefully that isn't confusing, two different approaches. But it highlights, look at what are the situations where something takes place to try and understand. Could it be anxiety? Could it be restlessness and more of a, a habit? We Thank should probably you. cut ourselves off Thank you. at this point. Um, but... Uh, yeah, are we getting the wrap up? Thank you very much for your attention, you. everybody. Stop, come and approach us afterwards. Thanks for listening to the ASF podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support us, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating or review. And please don't forget to subscribe.